Welcome to the Sand Hills Media Ministry. We hope this production encourages and challenges you to live a more Christ-centered life. Thank you, thank you. Hey, it's good to see you guys. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I am exhausted. I just got back from Kansas. Uh, went out to uh, uh, bury a friend of mine who passed unexpectedly. Uh, but he was more than a friend of me. His, uh, his name is Alan Hildebrand. I've talked about him a lot in this uh, church over the years. We called him Big Al affectionately. Uh, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that I wouldn't be married to Michelle if it wasn't for him and his influence as ministry, uh, nor would I probably be a pastor. So um, just that this dude meant a lot to me in my life. And uh, went out to Kansas. I don't know if you've been to Kansas lately. Uh, Y'all got to go through Kansas at some point. You got to drive through Kansas at some point. And you'll be driving around going, oh, dang. Like, there's nothing out here. I mean, you get, it's just flat and nothing is what it is. Um, and the funeral was in Stafford, Kansas. Uh, again, not an exaggeration to say. There will be more people involved in the church service this morning than there are in Stafford, Kansas. Uh, like, I heard a couple old boys talking, and they talk about people just on first name. Like, who cuts your hair? Oh, Nancy? Oh, yeah. I went to her for a while, but I go to Jan now. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, okay. We just know everybody. That's how, that's how it is in this town. And uh, so anyway, but it was great. And we went to his funeral, and Alan lived a good life. This was a life well lived. Like, he lived the kind of life that at his funeral, you didn't have to lie about him. You know, that, that's what you want. You want, when people get to your funeral, nobody has to lie. They can tell, you know, you're a great person. And he started off in campus ministry. He was in campus ministry for a little over a decade, I think. And then he became a farmer out in Kansas because that's what his family was doing. And uh, he did some other stuff, uh, but mostly farmer and driving oil was kind of the main things that he did towards the end of his life. But through it all, consistent, loved Jesus and would push everybody else to love Jesus. And in his wake and at his funeral, all sorts of people in ministry, pastors, missionaries, and then just people who love Jesus who are working their jobs that God's called them to. Just a beautiful, uh, beautiful thing. Now, uh, it is funny because it kind of ties in a little bit to what we're going to be talking about today. We're getting near the end of 2 Samuel. If you have your Bibles with you, open up to 2 Samuel. We'll be in chapter 23 today. When you get to the end of 2 Samuel, it is very much David or the author of uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel, looking back over the life of David to say what he had produced. And the thing about David's life, it is, it is all out there. Nobody's lying about anything. But the one thing we do know is through it all, David, uh, despite his ups and downs, kept his eyes on the Lord. And uh, that's where we want to end up today, and that's the kind of life we want to live. So uh, going to 2 Samuel chapter 23, 23 is going to be a bit interesting because it's kind of like 22. And of course, you know, the scripture was not originally given to us with chapters and verses. Uh, people added that later. So you have this whole like psalm. So 22 was kind of a psalm. It's a, it's a praise song David wrote about uh, the Lord. And then uh, we get 23 and it very much stays in the same theme. You've got this praise hymn, this praise song about what David has done in his life. So we'll call this David's worship song part two. Uh, so let's start off with verse one. Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. So already, verse one, we've got some great stuff going on here. So it says here, now these are the last words of David. Okay, one thing you need to know about the last words of David. These are not actually the last words of David. They're, <laughs> they're not. Uh, this is the title of the song. The title of his song is The Last Words of David. That's what he calls it. Um, it would be like a song, like uh, The Final Countdown. The Final Countdown, like... When I say the final countdown, if you don't immediately have a song playing in your head, you are too young. You, you go, to, go, go listen to that today. You got to you know, pull up your music account, whatever it is, listen to final countdown. Uh, but yeah, just this, that's the title of the song. And then he goes on to say, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse. All right, the oracle means God has given me something to proclaim. And oracle of David, the son of Jesse. And so now he's looking back and he's thinking about, uh, about how his life started, about how this whole thing started. And he's pausing to give glory to God, to, to say that this life I've lived is not because I'm amazing, it's because God did something. The son of Jesse, we remember back in 1 Samuel, uh, for those who studied with us, where out of the blue, Samuel shows up at this dude's house, Jesse's house, and he's like, hey, do you got any kids? And he's like, I got, I got some boys running around here. And he looks at all of them, and Samuel's like, do you have any other kids? And he's like, well, I got this one doofy kid out in the field with the sheep. And they're like, bring the doofy kid in here. And they come in and, it, and God's like, that's the one. And he anoints him for no known reason to the family and leaves. 
and, uh, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon him and just his whole life takes a whole new turn. Uh, so this is David. He's looking back now. The oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob. By the way, when you see anointed, literally the, the history of anointing is in actual anointing, actual oil. So he's looking back to when I was anointed by Samuel to serve the Lord. And then he calls himself the sweet psalmist of Israel. What a great name. Like, I don't know if he came up with that. Maybe if you're like, David, did you just make that name up about yourself? I mean, he might be like, well, I don't, I don't say that. People say that about me, you know? Like, uh, and sweet psalmist of Israel. What a phonetically pleasing name. You got the sweet psalmist of Israel. These just these S's that just kind of flow together. Good lunch conversation. What would your name be? Like if you had to pick a name about how God's blessed you and anointed you and you can make a name out of it, what would it be? Um, it's funny, I was talking to a friend of mine years ago, he's a mentor to me, he's uh, older than me, great preacher, uh, God's really gifted him. And I was talking to him one day about just how we were wired and he said something about like, well, I already know, you know, I'm a very gifted teacher. And I, the look on my face clearly was like, Oh, you're a very gifted teacher. Uh, and he was like, no, he's like, I'm not bragging. I'm, I'm saying, I know how God's wired me. And, uh, and I've heard the testimony that others have said, and it's just a gift I have. Um, and I was thinking, you know, okay, that's not wrong. If you just own how you know God has wired you, that's fine. Uh, so give yourself a good nickname today and uh, tell your family about it. All right, verse two. The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His words uh, uh, is on my tongue. And so he's already saying now, like, God is using me. God is speaking through me. He's saying, I am playing the role of the prophet. So God is speaking through me. Uh, now, verses three and four. Now, as we go into verses three and four, uh, he's going to shift a bit here, and he's going to talk uh, about this thing that God is doing, which we saw back with the Davidic covenant. So we're going to start to pick up now in verse three. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. All right, so we're talking about this ruler now. Now, it's not God himself. This is what God produces. And then the ruler is one who submits to the Lord well. So he's referring to somebody else. And so is he referring to David? Is he referring to people like David? And so I don't think so. I think this is actually a reference back to the fulfillment of this covenant he made. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull that out uh, of verse five, and we're gonna read that in just a second. But the, the thing we know this guy is gonna produce, this, this ruler who is fully submitted to God, he's gonna produce light, and he's gonna produce rain. Right, and so these are things. Now, if you're speaking to farmers, that's what they want to hear. Like when I, so, um, so Big Al before he passed, Big Al and I would talk almost every week. Uh, we would either text or talk uh, a lot of times just about what was going on in the Midwest. Uh, and we we're sports fans, so we talked about all the teams. Um, but he told me one time, he said, "Do you know at our church, almost all the conversation in the lobby is about the weather." And I was like, that makes sense. <laughs> you're all farmers, and they are farmers, by the way, like real life cowboys. They did a they did a hymn. Uh, at this funeral, uh, that was not my cup of tea, I'll be honest. Uh, but four like real cowboys got up and they sang a four part kind of harmony hymn type thing that was very appropriate to Stafford, Kansas. It was, it was great and the people loved it. Uh, but so here, these guys who are, that's their world. Like the, the, if you can have a, a leader who will give you sunlight and give you rain, like that's what you need. So this is great. So who are we talking about? Verse five, for does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? All right, so now he references the covenant. Now, the covenant we know came from 2 Samuel chapter 7, and this was the promise that a ruler would sit on David's throne forever and ever. And we know that wasn't David. We know it wasn't Solomon. Uh, there was no king that fulfilled that. And so the Jewish people themselves expected that they would have Messiah. By the way, if you've forgotten what Messiah means, Messiah means the one anointed by God. So that's what Messiah means, anointed one. So he's the one anointed by God to lead. So they were all expecting Messiah. He makes a reference to that. Now, in the Old Testament, you'll see a division of people into, into just two categories. It's very clear in the Old Testament. And actually, it's pretty clear in the New Testament, too. There are just two types of people. And I would even say, in your world today, there's really just two types of people. So in the Old uh, Testament, what you'll find is a division between, uh, maybe we just call them the righteous and the wicked. That's the two divisions. And actually, then when you get to the New Testament, there's the same kind of division. Maybe we would call them um, Christ followers and then the wicked or maybe whatever it would be. And actually in our day to day, it's the same thing. You're either a follower of Christ or you're part of those that would be identified as the wicked. 
uh, those outside of the love and the redemption uh, of God. And so uh, now he's gonna talk about the people on the other side of this, verse six. But worthless men are like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they are utterly consumed with fire. So then he talks about just worthless men are like thorns. So you're in South Carolina. If you have a yard in South Carolina, you've encountered thorns, right? And you don't want to encounter them unsuspectingly. That's the worst time to do it. Like the time when you see that weed growing out of whatever flower bed or something you got going down there, and you reach down to pick it, and when you do it, you know, it bites you, and you're like, ah, you know? Do you ever get angry at weeds? Just like, <laughs> I've yelled at weeds before. Like, I'm, they're cool with it. Um, and then, you know, and then you pull them out of the ground, and you're stomping them down, or whatever it would be, and then you throw them in, the, and you put them in the bin, and they're hauled away, and they're gone forever. Well, that's what David says is true about worthless men. Like, that, that's, that's how valuable they are. They just need to be thrown away and gone forever. So, when we look at Scripture and we talk about worthless people, I do want to give one caveat to the people of today. Because if I ask you, name a worthless person in this world. Like, I'm sure you got somebody in your head. But I, I'm, let me just give a pause here. Jeff, pre-Christ, the things I did, the things I valued, the things I loved, I... I think it was pretty worthless. A lot, a lot of that was pretty worthless. Um, but now I'm in Christ, and I think now I'm part of the righteous, part of the redeemed. Uh, God's producing good things through me. And so I've had two stages to my life, just like you have, right? So we want to be careful. Like, maybe we would call them the currently wicked, <laughs> the current weeds of this world, but we are praying for their redemption. And I do want to be reminded of this too, but before we sign off on people just being, you know, horrible, wicked, whatever it would be. Like they still, they're created in the image of God. So we still want to value that regardless of, you know, how they're wired. So while they still draw breath, there's hope. We want to pray for people that uh, would maybe fit the category of the worthless or the wicked. Um, and who knows that God might give them grace. But truly there are some people who seem worthless <laughs> in this world. I get it. Um, and so now this is funny. So we're, here we are, chapter 23, and then we just make a hard shift away from all we've been doing. We finished the song. The song started in 22, goes into 23, a little different thing. And then it just stops and it's like, all right, let's talk about some of David's special forces. And it is a, just a hard turn in scripture. So since scripture makes that turn, we're going to make that turn, and we're going to talk about some of David's special forces. I said as we've been going through this, and there's been several times we've seen them, like David had some of these elite fighters that surrounded him. Uh, these were uh, military heroes. Uh, they, were, they were tough soldiers. They went out. They did the hardest stuff. Now, so he had a big batch of these guys, and then smaller group, and then a smaller group, and a smaller group. So we've got this, these divisions. And so we stop here, and it's like, all right, let's just talk about his big ones, all right? So David had three, in particular, three mighty men. They were like the toughest dudes surrounding him. These were his special, special forces. But of the three, there's one that stands above the others. And so he is the mightiest man of record in all of Israel's history. It's amazing. All right. And then you have the other two. And then there's like a group of 30. And then if you go to, here you're in chapter 23. If you go to verse 39, it closes with a reference to Uriah the Hittite. We'll come back to him. Uh, and then it says 37 in all. So he's got 37 mighty men. Now, ironically, if you count all the men in chapter 23, you will not get to 37. <laughs> so uh, they talk about some others who pop in here. It's just a few. Uh, we're missing a few, but that's all right. Um, so we go through and we talk about these mighty men. And because they're in scripture, I think it's just going to be uh, fun to talk about here. Um, all right. So we'll go and we'll pick up with uh, verse 8 here. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb Beshebeth, a Tekamanite. He was chief of the three. He wheeled his, his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. All right, now listen, I know, we're not, we're not warriors, many of us. No, there's some. So we do have military people here. Thank you for your service and the stuff you guys have to do. Praise God, the rest of us don't have to do. Um, but these are, these are warriors. I don't, I don't care if you're a warrior or not. Like, at times, you just gotta show some respect. This is a guy who they're gonna name medals after. Like this year, the Joshua Beshebeth medal goes to whatever this person is for outstanding bravery, you know, whatever it would be. He killed 800 people in one battle with a spear. I couldn't do that with a bomb. I mean, like, <laughs> the, this dude's a beast. He's just standing in a field taking on 800 people with one spear. I'm more likely to hurt myself, right? So you look at this guy, you're like, okay, 
Total respect where respect is due. And this is what I love. He's such a beast, they just say one thing about him because, here's why, here's why you don't have the whole story because they would have mentioned him, killed 800 people and, and everybody would have been like, oh yeah, we know that dude, right? Like we don't know that dude. They know that dude. They're like, oh, yeah, you not, enough said, right? That guy's a beast. So he's the, he's the number one out of all of them. All right, then we go to the next one, verse nine. And next to him among the three mighty men was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. All right, now I know you hear the name Dodo, you think of Dodo bird, something Dodo silly, whatever it is. Hey, let me tell you this. You're gonna mock Eleazar at your own peril. All right, <laughs> the dude's a beast. All right, so let's go. This man was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahoi. Uh, he was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. And the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. Now, I don't want you to miss the story because here's what happened with Eleazar. So you have a battle that occurs. Everybody's fighting it. The word is given, retreat, you know? And so all the soldiers pull back except for Eleazar. Eleazar's like, nah, I think I'll stay. And so everybody pulls back. He pulls out his sword and he goes for it. So much so. They're all back here. They've retreated. They've gotten back to where they're safe. And somebody's like, where's that? Have you guys seen Eleazar? Where's that? Oh my gosh, we left Eleazar. They go back and they're just bodies everywhere. And he's sitting there going, and he's, he's fought so much. He can't drop his sword. His hand is frozen to his sword. His muscles have contracted. So he's just stuck there. And he's just, I mean, you can just see this guy covered in blood. And they're like, what did you do? <laughs> oh my gosh. But, and it says, they just came back to pick up the stuff. You're like, well, they're all dead. We'll just take it. You know, like, thanks, bud. You know, like, so, I mean, some of these guys, the stuff they're doing is crazy stuff. But don't miss this. Don't miss this. Because it says here, the Lord brought about a great victory that day. So the reason these guys are successful, we'll do one more. But uh, the reason these guys are successful is because they're willing to, to take a stand they're willing to demonstrate courage in the midst of an intense battle with evil, God steps in and they do something amazing. So here's what it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder what amazing thing God is waiting to do through you. When you come to a place where nobody else is gonna say it, nobody else is gonna do it, if you do it, you're gonna be at risk. You could lose your job, you could lose your reputation, like whatever it would be. But if you would step forth in courage and God met you in that moment, what might have, what story might we read about you in the future? All right? So, all right, so that's two of them. Let's go to one more, verse 11. And next to him was Shema, the son of Ag, the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. All right, stop. Lentils or beans, all right? So here's, here's what people would do in the old days. Like when you would go to attack an enemy, one of the things that you'd wanna do is you'd wanna attack during harvest. See, that was the best time to attack because then you didn't have to be the one who found the field, cultivated the field, planted the seed, tended to it, made sure it all grew right, and then harvested it. Like you can skip all the hard work, just go steal the fruit of other people's labor, right? So here they are, it is harvest time, the Philistines show up and they're there to take it. All right, the Philistines gathered together at Lehi where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the men fled from the Philistines. All right, well, hold on. It makes sense. They're, they're farmers, right? They're, you're farmers, an army shows up, you're like, dude, I do not, I don't do that for a living. I do this, right? And you know what? They can have the beans. And so they, they just leave, the, the people flee for their lives. It makes total sense, right? The men fled from the Philistines, verse 12. But he, Shema, took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines and the Lord worked a great victory. So this is another moment where everybody runs in fear and shame is like, nah. He's like, you know what? You want these beans? Come and claim them. And he pulls out the sword and then he just goes to town. And then people come back. Again, bodies everywhere. And it's like, what did you do? I mean, just this thing. And again, the Lord worked a great victory just from somebody that was willing to demonstrate some courage, willing to stand up and willing to battle for the Lord. This is, a, this is just a beautiful moment. So this is your big three. Those are the, the big three. Those are the heroes of Israel all in their day, super well-known. I mean, they were, they were amazing. They were heroes. Then you get to this other group, the 30. Now the 30, 
It's not like the 30 are pansies. Like these other 30, these are strong, tough men as well. And there's an, another few bonus that are thrown in here. So let's read about these other few. Uh, verse 13, and three of the 30 chief men, all right? So now we're in another level. Three of the 30 chief men went down and they came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried it and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord and said, far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. All right, so we don't know when the story occurred. Sometime, obviously, in the history of, uh, of David's life. But David's from Bethlehem. And so he's with these dudes. They're all, I mean, these are warriors. He's with these warriors. And he just makes the comment. Like, he grew up in this town. He grew up in Bethlehem. So he's like, oh, man, I just wish I had a cup of water from that well. And I was like, that's my favorite well. You know, I just wish I had a glass of water. And so he's with these, I mean, you're around these super tough soldiers. So these three dudes are on the side. And they're like, all right, listen, I got an idea. <laughs> you know what? Let's go get him a glass of water from the well. And they're like, are you kidding? Like, yeah, let's do it. And so they, they go on their own, infiltrate, fight, beat down. We don't know how many people uh, they had to fight their way through to get to this well, to draw a cup of water, to bring it back to David. And then they bring it to David and they're like, right, David, you're not gonna believe this. We brought you a cup of water. And I don't know, are they covered in blood? Are they panting? They're sweating? Are they coming like, hey, we got you the cup of water. And David's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, so for a moment there, I mean, I think if I was one of those guys, I'd be like, <laughs> we went through a lot of work to get that for you. Um, I don't, that's not actually what happened if you're reading there. And so there's this thing that Jewish people used to do where they would give a drink offering to the Lord, a drink offering to the Lord. Not something you and I do, it's something they did historically. Uh, and so the idea is that I would give the first portion, the best portion maybe uh, to the Lord. I'm giving this as an offering to the Lord. And so when they bring this to him, He's like, you know, you guys are amazing. And this thing that you did, like, I, here's the thing. I'm not worthy of all the work you went through to bring that to me. And you risked your own lives to do it. So to honor you, to honor your lives, to honor this uh, cup, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna dedicate it to the Lord. And so he pours it out as an offering to the Lord. He's not just dumping it. So he does that as an offering to the Lord. Now, I, I can't help but think, if I was one of the three, though, I mean, might be like, dude, could you taste it a little? <laughs> like, I mean, we really worked for this. There's like, there's a string of dead people out there that, that uh, you know, we went through for that. So, um, but anyway, that's what they do. Now, if you read the rest of the chapter, and I do encourage you to do it, you'll hit other heroes of the faith um, that we've read about in there. Heroes uh, like Abishai, he's played a big role in there. There's another guy who uh, steals a man's weapon then kills him with it, a beast of a move on the battlefield. Uh, and then it closes with verse 39. Now, verse 39, I think it's important, and I think the last name is important. Um, it gets to Uriah the Hittite. So Uriah was the man that David killed after he'd committed adultery with Bathsheba. That was Bathsheba's husband. And I think very distinctly that name is left in there, probably just as a reminder. Like, you know, we are the sum of our lives. And so this is David wrapping up the sum of his life, all this great stuff God has done with the asterisks, Uriah, the whole thing. And um, it's just... It's just a part of the testimony of, of David's life. And I do think that's why Uriah is kind of given this special place at the end so that we'd all be like, oh, yeah, Uriah. Um, and so now here we are at the end of this. Now, clearly, clearly, this is not a teaching passage. It's a historical passage teaching us about things that occurred in the past. So with scripture, you know, uh, there's not always a thus saith the Lord. But again, I've been doing something I call lessons learned where we look at this and, you know, is there something that you can draw from here that makes you think about something uh, that maybe we could apply? So in these lessons learned, I w there's two sections here. So the one section is a reference to this anticipated Lord of light, Lord of rain, nourishment for the earth. Um, and so let's, let's talk about him for a second. Let's talk about um, maybe following this Lord of light who w I would say is Jesus. I don't, think, I don't think I'm off on that. Um, but here's, here's the thing about salvation. You have not been saved by the blood of Christ just so that you could enjoy the fact that you are saved, right? Like he didn't, he didn't die just so that you could go like, I am so happy and content now. I'll go to heaven when I die. And now I can just live my own little world. And you know, like that's not the point of salvation. The point of salvation and what God is doing in you is 
because of what God is going to do through you. So it's like this. The Lord of light shines on you, but you're not, you're not supposed to be absorbing all that light. You're supposed to be a mirror that reflects that light. So when Jesus shines on you, that light goes back out into the world. And so this Lord of light shines onto you so that you can shine onto and into the lives of other people. Now, the, the, the light darkness metaphor is throughout Scripture, and especially in the New Testament. There's a lot in the New Testament. Um, so I found one passage that I think does a good job of talking about us as children of light, and then very much a division between the righteous and the, the thorns, if you will. And so I just, this section from Ephesians chapter 5, I thought I'd read it just because it ties in. Uh, it's Ephesians 5, 1 through 12. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. All right, so this idea that you have a father, you imitate your father. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So then he says, listen, you know, your Lord and Savior demonstrated for us a sacrificial love. I want you to walk in that same way. I want you to demonstrate sacrificial love to this world. Now, in this culture, historically, uh, they struggled with sexual immorality. There's a big issue for them. Now, here's what's funny, of course. <laughs> that's, our culture. that's our culture, too. And uh, the thing you'll notice in Scripture, regardless of whatever technological advancements we have had, from the creation of the world until now, people are basically the same. The things we desire, the things we want, the things we fear, the things we try to achieve, uh, the wrestling with our own morality and mortality, like all these things... People have wrestled with that forever. There's nothing new here. And so when he writes this, these words are still very relevant today. But sexual immorality and all impurity of co or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are all out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Now, the thing I love about this passage, of course, reference to the Lord, the Lord of light. The Lord shines the light unto us. And we who were formerly in darkness, right, that we were the thorns, we were the unrighteous, now having been delivered, we are now light bringers, that we expose the darkness. That's what we do. Um, so this is very much our mission in this. Too, I love this. It ties up something I think is very important. Nobody grows in their faith passively. You have to actively engage your faith. You're not going to grow just because you're a Christian. You have to choose to grow by putting yourself in positions to do that, which takes me to the second point. I would say this. Surround yourself with heroes. Surround yourself with heroes. So let's talk about surrounding yourself with heroes. And for me, that was Big Al. Uh, Big Al in my life was a guy that pushed me to be a better version of a Christ follower than I would be all on my own. There's this passage in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. There is very much the sense in scripture that we provoke one another. We push one another to do the things that God has called us to do. Like this whole like Ezekiel ministry thing and all that, like that's us pushing you to do something that you're like, yeah, I'd rather not. Like, so of course, like nobody would rather do anything. We'd rather just chill. So one of the things I loved in college was uh, Alan pushed us and I was with a group of guys. And he would do things like, all right, this week, we're all going to memorize this verse or this passage. And the next week, we together, we're holding each other accountable for it. And, and we would do it. It was like this, this dude thing. We we're all like, yeah. Um, and then, or it'd be like, hey, this week, share your faith with three people. Next week, we're going to talk about what God did through that. And we'd be like, yeah, let's do it. So like all these things, like pushing us to do stuff, we wouldn't normally take those risks on our own. In fact, um, on the airplane yesterday, as I was flying back, I was sitting next to this lady, uh, and I told her I was a pastor, which always <laughs> changes the whole conversation. Whatever you're in the middle of, it changes the whole thing. So uh, we get there, and she's like, oh, I'm a Christian as well. And so we end up in this neat conversation. And she said, listen, she said, one of the things I've always wanted to do is to read through the whole Bible, and I've never done it, and I've just wanted to do it for years. And I was talking to some girlfriends, and they were the same way. They were all like, I want to do it, and I've never done it either. So she said, we formed a group, and we decided we were going to do it together. And we all committed, and we're now finishing our study after the end of about a year. And I was like, that's awesome. Like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Where you're like, on my own, I'd, I'd wimp out. 
But if I get others involved, they will push me, they'll provoke me to this love and these good works that I'm supposed to do. Which is why at Sandhills, when we emphasize community, we want you in groups where you're together, hanging out together, encouraging one another, pushing each other to do the things that you're called to do. Like community is God's design to help you become who he's intended you to be in this world. And so I'm gonna pray for that right now. Father God, thank you for this moment just to pause and to think uh, about this great stuff in scripture, Lord. Uh, one thing we think about is our Lord of light, um, who by his own sacrifice has offered freely to us redemption in his name and through his work on the cross. Uh, but Lord, now as children of the light, we become light bearers in this world. We expose darkness. And so, Father, I pray that we would embrace that courage where we would stand up and say, God, work through me to accomplish some mighty things in your name. And Father, then just the, the whole design you've got for this is that it is in the context of community that we would become who you've intended us to become. So Father, whether it is us pushing our brothers and sisters in Christ or they pushing on us, Father, help us to be a better version of what you've intended for us. Let us push one another on towards love and good works in your holy name. Amen.